Defenders uh, Solidarity Forum. Uh, today is February 20th, 2016. Tomorrow is the 21st, and I mentioned that because we're doing this program in honor of uh, the memory of Malcolm X. This week is essentially the anniversary of uh, the last week of Malcolm X's life. And we thought that we would start the program Um, we wanted to start the program by showing 10 minutes, uh, an excerpt from a debate that in England, Oxford University, it was the Oxford University student debate, and um, the 10 minutes that we're going to show you is his response, uh, a section of his response to the uh, speaker before him. And we think that he makes points uh, that are relevant to the purpose of today's forum. Um, well, uh, sorry, my name is Hannah Edwards. I'm the chairperson of the Sacred Ground Historical Reclamation Project. I'm a member of the Defenders for Freedom, Justice, and Equality. Um, the organization wanted to put this together because of, in essence, the, um, the hard economic times and the racist rhetoric of extreme right-wing politicians has been creating an intensified climate of fear and of hatred for Muslims, immigrants, communities of color in general. And at the same time, police continue to murder unarmed black people. Unions are under increasing attacks, and our environment is threatened by profit-driven corporations like the Michigan <coughs> This forum brings together representatives from these communities and struggles to learn from each other and to discuss concretely how we can support each other in these increasingly dangerous times. Um, I'm going to read the list of people who are going to be speaking today so that you have an idea of the program and we encourage you to please stay because we are at the end going to talk about um, one particular mechanism that can help us um, work together in each other's defense when these attacks and threats of attacks arise. The first uh, speaker will be um, Nurahoda Ramadan. She's a Richmond community activist and she will be um, speaking on Islamophobia in the Middle Eastern community. Our second speaker will be Daiya Rashid. She is a member of the Defenders and she is going to be speaking about Islamophobia in the Black community. Rebecca Keel will be speaking on, on Black Lives Matter uh, uh, attacks on undocumented. Rebecca Keel is a community organizer and activist with song on Black Lives Matter and she will be speaking on Black Lives Matter. Attacks on undocumented immigrants, Carolina Velez uh, is uh, here with is program coordinator of the Wayside Center for Popular Education. Labor Fights Back uh, is a presentation that will come from uh, Defenders member and longtime community activist Rolanda uh, McMillan, uh, who's worked with Virginia Reza. And then uh, the last uh, presentation will be Dominion Resources and Our Environment, and that will be presented by Travis Williams, uh, who works with Justice RBA. We will have time for discussion uh, at the end of the presentations. Um, and so at this time, um, I would just like to ask you to bear with me while I hopefully this actually turns on when I turn it on. Um, but again, this is a 10 minute excerpt uh, from uh, the Oxford University Student Union Debate in England, uh, December 3rd, 1964. Just one step farther, the scene might justify in this stand. And I say, I'm not speaking, I'm speaking as a black man from America, which is a racist society. Thank you. 
that the only way we'll get freedom for ourselves is to identify ourselves with every oppressed people in the world. Our first speaker is Nora Elwoda Ramadan. She's a Richmond community activist, and she is going to speak on Islamophobia and the Middle Eastern community. Silence is not neutral. 
Years from now, historians will likely look back at this period in American history as one of the heightened prejudice amongst a significant portion of the, I'm sorry, of the public and short-sightedness amongst many political leaders. And the contest to see the most Islamophobic between GOP presidential candidates, front runner, front runner, Donald Trump has clearly outdone the rest. Donald Trump's comments that Muslims should be banned from the United States while not representative of what all Americans believe reflect the negative view of Muslims. Trump's rhetoric and the perception that many Americans um, are Muslims in a way hits at the heart of the reason for the detrimental nature of many U.S. policies towards the Muslim world. For those who didn't already know, the word Islam means peace in Arabic. And the mass majority of proper Muslims who follow the correct teachings of Islam are just that, peaceful. Myself, my daughters, along with the other Muslim Americans all over the country have every right to work, study, walk the streets, drive the streets, go to our place of worship, and travel cross country without fearing for our lives or having our rights and privileges privileges compromised because of the faith and religion we have chosen. I stand before you today and ask you to help us defend ourselves against Islamophobia, to come together and handle ignorance with truthfulness. I invite the media to cover and research more about the good the other 99.9% .9 of Muslims are doing for their communities and other communities surrounding. <clears throat> I am open to any and all suggestions for solutions to shed light on this ongoing problem. In the great words of Malcolm X, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have, to, they have the power to make the innocent look guilty and the guilty look innocent because they control the minds of the mass media. Also in the great words of Martin Luther King Jr., darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I am a Palestinian by blood, and love is my language. Humanity is my ethnicity, peace is my religion, and solidarity is my anthem. Thank you all for your support. One race, mm -hmm. and it's one God. Mm -hmm. 
regardless of what people want to think. We need to be respected. I was spit at out of a car when I was in full hijab. I've also been told, and don't act like I know y'all had a bill collector to call you, okay? <laughs> I was told by the bill collector when I said, I'm sorry, I don't have it right now. But then you need to take your, you know what, back to uh, Egypt or somewhere. You don't belong here anyway. What is this man talking about? He can't even see me. That's <laughs> oh, my last name. <laughs> so he ripped over me to think I'm supposed to even be here. And I'm born in America, not by choice. Never by choice will I have been here. <laughs> so keeping it real, you know, keeping it real. You brought me here, but you don't want me. You teach people that come from other countries when you bring them here, and that lessons don't mess with the black people because they're all crazy. So don't mess with those black folks because they'll hurt you. They all rob. They all steal. You know, so I already had that against me. And becoming a Muslim, I've had my scar pulled on the bus. You know, I'm so thankful that Muslims are intelligent people as well as black, whites, Mexicans, whoever. Because when you taunt and ask children in school, see, I be one of them at school getting ready to go, go to you, okay? But thank God we had people that used a little more intelligence than I did and decided to open our own schools. Because I dare you to mess with the children of all people. That's because right. they are innocent people That's that were right. brought into this world. And you do not taunt little children because they wear a scarf on their head. Mm -hmm. Before we came here, all people wore scarves on their head. Blacks, whites, every nationality had something on their head. They covered themselves mm -hmm. for modesty. And also for you to represent them as a pious and a clean person, a person who's trying to do the right thing. So we need to get it together and understand the media and America, all of our politicians, has played Muslims as all terrorists. Mm -hmm. I wonder how the hell can they do that? Mm -hmm. Well, we got a group in America that's been here since I was born and before called the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You ain't killed none of them. Come you wanted to kill the farmers on that land on. because they fought, wanted to fight what belongs to them. But we got Ku Klux Klan probably sitting in here now. Come but on. I ain't scared of you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you hate me as a black person, as a Muslim, and everything else, and as a woman, because I'm outspoken. You know, we got to take this a little deeper. This has nothing to do, basically, with Islam. It has to do with you wanting to be God. That's right. You see, a lot of people I know, they're atheists here to eat you something. But I know I didn't involve from a monkey, because I don't know why the monkey's not still having humans. You know what I'm saying? I came from a power higher than me. You know, and a lot of people don't want to recognize that because they want to play God. Like Bob Marley said, because men think they want, they're more powerful than God. Mm -hmm. So the ones that run the country have started the phobias. Mm -hmm. The ones that run the country and the social media has made all of us look like terrorists mm -hmm. when we're not. And if they want to see something crazy, mess with our children. Mm -hmm. And it don't have to be by the gun because yeah. the pen is mightier than the sword. Mm -hmm. And we as people need to learn Whatever color we are, we have to work together. As I said, there is only one race. All of y'all got some of my blood in you. So all of y'all in me. All y'all my cousins, okay? Mm -hmm. So we need to act like that. Respect each other like that. And stop fighting amongst each other. Get our communities together. Start teaching. When you see that crap on the news about this, about the Mexicans, the borders, when you see that crap on the news about Islam is coming in, we got to stop them. Oh no, you need to start then telling everybody you know, look at that stupid stuff they're saying. Mm -hmm. God, how much sense does that make? So yes, I've been bashed as a Muslim, but I was bashed before I became Muslim. You know, there's Islamophobia. We have to first respect the fact that you Christians, that's all right for me. You Jewish, that's all right for me. I'm Muslim, that's very right for me. So therefore, we have to learn to respect one another and learn that we are all of one race, a human race, and stop fighting amongst each other. So the government, just like we need to put our people in the office. We don't need somebody to came from out of nowhere. We need to start getting our people from our communities. Then they will represent all of us, Muslim, black, Christian, Jews, everywhere. That's what we need to do as a people. Band together and show them you're the stupid person, you're the idiots, and we're not going to say it for you. Stop working together and loving each other. Peace and blessings to all of you.
appreciate our speakers so far. We stuck right to the time uh, that, that we uh, set for each presentation. Our next uh, speaker is going to be uh, Rebecca Keel. She's a community organizer and activist with Song Southerners. Uh, Southerners organized on the ground and Black Lives Matter. violence and discrimination and the lack of access to resources and knowledge that our community faces um, and also like lack of credibility seemingly no matter what your credentials are what you represent where you come from if you're black if you are red is that automatically your voice is invalid and that is continually happening um, and it's just, it's a product of this racist mindset that people are really stuck in in this country. Um, there's also a lot of internalized oppression in the black community, and through that we become our own oppressors. So the fact that black folks, um, no matter what your background is, are oppressing other black people, that's not all right. That's not all right. Black transgender folks, um, black disabled people, black women, um, black children, they are on the equal playing field as everyone else, but for some reason, within and outside of the black community, those voices are silenced way too often. That needs to stop. Um, and also, I'm just gonna say a piece about black families. I love my family dearly. Um, and we don't always agree politically, um, and conversations often cannot be had, but the silencing of mental health issues that are very real, mental health stuff is not a white person's problem. It's not. Everyone, everyone has a brain and emotions and feelings and life that is connected to that. So the fact that sometimes, or oftentimes, these conversations can't happen within our own families, it can be really devastating and have a really lasting effect. So. You know, a lot of that happens, though, because of the society that we live in, these institutions that set it up to make our voices not valuable, even within our own families. Um, and so I'm coming from this perspective. I do organizing work in the city, um, along with a lot of folks in the room, um, so respect. Um, but Black Lives Matter did not start in Richmond, although we've been doing a lot of work here for the past year or so. Um, but it was started by three queer, LGBTQ identified black women um, after the shooting of Trayvon Martin. Um, and it really got going here locally in 2014 after the non-indictment of the officer who shot and killed um, Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and so, a little bit about the movement for folks who might not be the most familiar is um, it's a, this is straight from the website I'm going to read. Um, so Black Lives Matter is an ideological and political intervention in a world where black lives are systematically and intentionally targeted for demise. It is an affirmation of black folks' contributions to the society, our humanity, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. Again, these systems of oppression that really push this lack of access, lack of knowledge, lack of resources. Um, the principles of Black Lives Matter are diversity, globalism, restorative justice, unapologetically black who will not apologize for who we are, transgender affirming, collective value, black women, black villages, empathy, black families, queer affirming, queer being another term for LGBTQ, 
loving, engagement, and intergenerational. We come from legacy, y'all. <laughs> like, we're coming from Harriet Tubman. I'm gonna bring it back all the way there. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of the work that started happening in 2014, we did um, a really large direct action um, that was a nationally organized direct action with Southern Organizing Against Racism, or SOAR, and um, through that action, we were able to make a lot of national connections as well as really hold it down in We had two separate actions going on that day. Um, one targeting um, the institutions that be through the city, so City Hall, those folks who we went to um, Broad Street where City Hall is, and we shut that down. And then simultaneously, there was a group that went out to a Weston Mall. I see the short pump or Stony Point. I can't remember the name of which one. But um, talking about and bringing connections to the fact that capitalism is a driving force for black oppression in this country. Um, also, um, we formed a Black Caucus in Richmond after the Virginia People's Assembly that happened that year. Um, and you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It was um, it was good that we came together, but there was still so much disagreement in the room. Um, you know, and we're working through it. <laughs> Um, so what are we doing now? Um, Black Lives Matter chapters are forming nationwide. Um, we're still trying to get one started in Richmond. There is organizing on the ground. Um, there are people in this very room that are still really rolling out the work. And thank you for that. Everyone think those folks are that. Um, this is Black History Month, or the tail end of it, but Black Lives Matter is seen as Black Futures Month instead of Black History Month because we really got to start being imaginative of what our futures can be and how they can be better than what it has been, uh, really. Um, so also, gaining political power. Um, we all know that these systems do not work, but it is really, really difficult, and it is proven after generation and generation to be difficult fighting power from the outside. We need to get in there, and we need to demolish while we are building. Um, so there are folks running. Um, Park Cannon um, in Georgia just won the Georgia House, um, which is a really, really big win because she's a queer LGBTQ um, woman of color and really holding it down there. We have folks running in Richmond, um, Lilia Estes. She's a black woman. She lives in public housing. She is of the people, for the people, by the people. She is, you know, us. And she's running for mayor. And this city really, really needs some conscious, some woke, some people who are, some black folks who are willing to represent the black community of Richmond, not the rich black community of Richmond, not that little society, but Richmond is still a mostly black city and most of the black people in this city are living in poverty. Most of the black people in Richmond are still living in poverty, majority black city. There's also folks running in other political positions um, around the country, whether that's city council or, or house or mayor or anything like that. Um, so we are trying to gain that. Um, uh, political power. Um, and then in consciousness raising, we're forefronting black issues. That's what Black Lives Matter is. Um, saying Black Lives Matter does not mean that we don't think anyone else's lives matter. That's not true. It's not logical. It's just saying black people have been stepped on and pushed down and spit on in this country for so long. We were brought <coughs> over here to be slaves and we're not slaves. We are free people, but what does freedom look like if we can't even talk about being black and people get offended? That's not freedom. Unapologetically black. Um, and also within consciousness raising, um, really digging into intersectionality, all black folks are not the same people. Period. You know, just because your skin is a certain way and you come from a certain, I don't know, stereotype of a culture, um, it does not mean that you subscribe to any of that. Blackness is what you make it. It really is for black people. Let me do that little caveat. <laughs> um, so also consciousness raising within the black community for friending um, black trans folks is so important because there are, um, is so much violence against black trans women specifically and it's because they're seen as deviant, like they don't belong in this culture. Everyone in this room, in this society, is where they should be right now, in the sense that we need to live our lives in ways that make us actually feel good 
who wants to live in ways that do not make them feel full and whole? Black trans folks, trans, transgender folks in general, not gender non-conforming and non-binary folks, um, we're just trying to live, you know? That's all it is. So, um, in the realm of uh, consciousness raising as well, um, just really connecting the struggles um, to black immigration as well. Um, so there are black immigrants in this country. Um, I think immigration gets looked at as a, like an issue for people from Mexico or Puerto Rico or Cuba or Dominican Republic, things like that. And yes, those folks definitely need the support, but there are black folks here. And also there are black folks from all those countries too. Um, and then I'll leave on this note. Um, so I'm in the MSW program at VCU, and we have started, this is not a Black Lives Matter chapter, but we have started the Black Lives Matter collective for the School of Social Work because, as a lot of y'all know or may not know, social workers are the gatekeepers of this country, y'all. People who are in those offices, um, you know, people who work at or, um, the Department of Social Services, who work at the courts, who work at City Hall, those are people who went to school, um, who have some knowledge about how these systems work. Those are our targets. Those are the people who can give us what we want and what we need for our freedom. And those are the most apathetic people I have ever met. And it really breaks my heart. How are you a helper and not a helper? I don't know. Um, so through that, um, the work that we've been doing in the school um, and broadening out to the community is a lot of social workers in Richmond um, have no idea about the community. They go to school here, um, and that doesn't even imply going to like a four-year college. You can get a social work degree from a um, community college as well, but they're so unacquainted with the community and the history and legacy that still is so prominent. You can taste it. This is a very racist city. We still have these monuments up. We still have a mostly white power structure for a mostly black city. There's something wrong with that. So we really gotta understand who our targets are. Um, and building the skills and resources um, for ourselves um, in the city, throughout the state, and throughout the region where we can really move this work and get free. So thank y'all.
a country that has the largest detention infrastructure around the world. Why is this? It's America. <laughs> Someone is profiting right. from this. We just went to the dumb dominion march. Profit over people. Mm -hmm. And over black, brown bodies and LGBTQ bodies. Guess who profit? So uh, Rebecca was saying, we need to identify our enemy at every single struggle. And we know that there is a system in place. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the enemy in this deportation and incarceration system. So there are corporations, and there are three biggest corporations, the Corrections Corporations of America, the GEO Group, and the MTG Group. And these people, just to give you the founder of the CCA, the Corrections Corporation of America, he openly came and said, when he was asked about detention on immigrants, this is his quote, phrases. You just sell it like you were selling cars or real estate of hamburgers. You just sell them like if you were selling cars or real estate or hamburgers. We're talking about people. We're talking about children. We're talking about humans. But if you see humans like not being legal, you're going to sell them. And I'm not only talking about legal in terms of documentation. I'm talking about legality in our bodies, in being who we are. We sell them. And these three groups, just for these past four years, have made a profit every year, a revenue of $5 billion. $5 billion. And guess who is lobbying and making the anti-immigrant laws that this country has? ALEC, American Legislative Exchange, together with these corporations, they get together like these people that want to put these toxics in our rivers, that were sitting in that office there at, at SunTrust Bank. They get together and put together anti-immigrant laws <coughs> that then pass down, and they pass down these laws without people even noticing through the media, making people believe that black people are criminals, that brown people are criminals, that LGBTQ people are criminals, and that everything that is not confronted is criminal and illegal. So they were the ones that advocated and came up with laws that made the police become immigration agents. So to give you an example, if an undocumented immigrant is a stop because they have a broken light in their car, and police officer has immigration capacity, they ask this person, where are you from? And because we come from a world where there is trust, or at least before this globalization, we trusted each other. We trusted people. When I have been talking with people, they say, but I told this person that I came here to be able to feed my family. No, you don't tell police and an immigration agent that you came here because you wanted to feed your family, because they don't care. They belong to a system that only serves the 1% and that only serves the people that are rich and that are in power and the profits. So we need to start thinking about, are we reforming this system? Or do we need to abolish incarceration and deportation? Because as our sister Daya said when she started, I don't know if, of course, everybody remembers the black codes, yes. right? 
What happened with our black people then? They, the system criminalized their daily lives. You were not able to stop at the corner without a permission to work, a permit to work. And why? Because they need us. They need our bodies in detentions and jails. Why? Because of free labor. Free labor. In the United States, the supreme law of this country is still accepted <coughs> slavery. Right. If you have a criminal charge, but a criminal charge is to go around with marijuana. And our people end up in the system, and then they end up doing free labor. And in that moment in town, like it happens here, that one of, our, of my brothers that is here made me realize not long ago that corporations and the government are leasing our people in prison yeah. and detention centers. Yeah. They take them out of the detention centers and prison to do labor for this class, rich class government people and we continue allowing this mm -hmm. and why stop the black coat situation are black people rising up and saying we're not going to continue this <coughs> the black panthers showed us a huge example of stopping all of the criminalization of black people when are we going to go back and learn from the history. Yes. When are we gonna know that when you hear a Latino person saying, oh, black people are criminals, mm. who put that knowledge in their brain? Mm -hmm. The media, the corporations, and this class, who is putting in our minds the fact that Islamic people <clears throat> are terrorists? Mm. The media and the same system that is criminalizing all of us. When are we gonna stop this? Because they are making money out of our bodies. For immigrant people um, in 2004, and the excuse every year is terrorist attacks, right? So immigrants, we belong under the Department of Homeland Security, this entity that was created that is called Immigration and Customs Enforcement. What does it say? That we are a threat to the security of the United States. Mm -hmm. And if you say a threat, like Noran was saying, a threat is for us mm -hmm. to take our children to school? Are we a threat because of us for that? Are we a threat because we make it here to this country and we know that detention and deportation belongs to a bigger system? Mm -hmm. Monsanto, mm -hmm. blotting, like flooding, our land with these seeds, right? The so-called war on drugs that are creating so much crime and so much violence in Latin America countries. And, you for, and here, and you're forcing migration. I'm not here because I, it was my choice. I came here because I was forced. I am a political asylum. And I would have never wanted to come here. My family is in my country still. I'm a single mother of Isabella. And even the air here for me is different. The first time that I was able to leave this, this country after being here 10 years, it was to Panama, not even my country. And when the air, airplane arrived in Panama and I came out of that airplane and I breathed that air, my body broke down and I started crying. I forgot what it felt mm -hmm. to breathe that Latin American air. I forgot what it felt to eat the food that is who I am. Mm -hmm. right. So I ask you today, what is the collective risk that we are going to be taking? Mm -hmm. Because if a system has to be abolished, mm -hmm. we all have to come together That's to right. abolish this system right. that uses the same mechanisms but that does everything possible to divide us every day.
fighting back. She has been working with Virginia Reyes up in the fight for $15 an hour. Hey, love. Yeah. 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 I will just say, we are at 4.18, and um, we do want to have some discussion. We're probably going to creep a little bit, but we, we need to keep it tight because we need to respect the fact that the library graciously and lovingly let us be here. Good evening, everyone. How y'all doing? Uh, with those heavy notes, I'm not even going to get that heavy, but um, in all reality, we kind of set up my stage for where labor comes in, because a lot of people say, well, what labor got to do with solidarity and discrimination <coughs> and all that? Well, they just set it up for you to let you know we got corporations that got us all in state. Because we made five dollars an hour, like in Mississippi, or maybe we made seven dollars an hour, like in Virginia, or maybe like oh New York, where are they getting twelve now? Wonder why they're getting twelve dollars an hour. One thing I know is that I am a, a, a person who was born in the sixties and was wondering what was going on. I knew what something was happening, I didn't know what was going on. And I'm not um, racist, I can be prejudiced, but I, I, because I was made prejudiced in a lot of ways, but I knew something was wrong, because when I was living, I, 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 was, I was not born in what they call the projects and all that kind of stuff. I lived in the house and everything, and I seen something's going on there. I read the Bible, and I'm like, wait a minute, that's not the same thing that's happening in this world. But anyway, we're going to go with <coughs> corporations. I'm with Raise Up to 15. We're fighting for a living wage for everybody. Not just, oh, can you speak up? We're, we're fighting for a, a living wage. Um, when I started working, uh, the minimum wage was $2.90. And when I got my first paycheck, I looked at it and I said, oh my God, something's wrong. <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm a teenager, but still, I could feel that I was worked more than what I had looked like on this check. So I said, oh, hold up, I, I need to do something. So that's when I went to school and I wanted to learn how to be the person who writes the check. But unfortunately, I probably didn't have that, I don't know, I'm going to do whatever you say type of attitude. So I didn't get everything, the loans, and my credit got messed up. You know, I didn't get all the things that you could get to run the business and everything. But fortunately, the Lord did give me a little something when I got back here in Richmond. But what, what we're facing in, in the Raise Up for the 15 is that everybody, it's not just the fast food restaurant workers. We got a grasp on it because of the fact that our employers, our corporations, mm -hmm. they make billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And you can see the billions of dollars, much faster than some of the mom pop stores and things like that. You see billions and billions of dollars being made by these people that don't want to pay them. So tied into what everybody's saying, it's another form of slavery. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh, so you got to pay $50 an hour. I make fifty dollars an hour. I got a Mercedes. I got this, I got that, I got that. I say, yeah. So try not going to work anymore and see where you're going to be at. You'll be where the rest of the other people are. Unemployed. Okay, well, every time they say, well, you need to have a budget. Well, you gotta have money. You gotta have money to have a budget because I could have sworn that I do at least for basic math. And basic math tells me that if I'm only getting $300 and my rent is $600, that's not gonna do. I'm gonna be in the negative. So, it doesn't matter where you are and who you are because of the fact that the way that these corporations have put us in the slave retaliation, you could have a master's degree and still be saying, how do you like your fries? How do you want your fries? You see what I'm saying? So you have people that will never get a pension. You know, back when, when I was younger, my mom, she didn't have to work. My dad had to work and was able to take care of everything. I mean, we only got a half a popsicle, but that was how things worked. You know what I'm saying? That was good life. That was good life. What we do in Raise Up is we say, hell no, can't. <coughs> we have to teach the people how to unionize, okay? This is a right to work state and all that stuff. A lot of people don't understand what it's about. We got a lot of things we got to do, so I got to be real short. But 
the main bottom line is what we do is we shut it down. Yes. We shut it down. And that's what we all have to do. Like Linda said, shut it down. We have a system here who has bought people from another country over, and they were foreigners, and they brought it to another country, and invaded the country, got slavery, built all this stuff. They think they're better than you now. And so then they say, oh, well, how do we enslave everybody? Mm-hmm. And that's why um, for some of the Caucasians who, who, who have had been privileged in life, they didn't understand it until saying, nowadays, now you're starting to see what the black folks been going through for a long time. You know what I'm saying? So what we do in Raise Up is we, we start the unions and we go fight and we shut it down. We get people signed up. Once you got 51% of the people in your job, they say, yeah, we want more money and we want benefits, and we want to be able to feed our children, and we come together, and we shut it down all over the world. Mm-hmm. Everybody's with us now. So these companies like Burger King, who wants to go to Canada, after they made all their money here, and go other places. Canada's not gonna pay that stuff, because you gotta pay these people, and I don't know what they're thinking. But you know, you're talking about, oh, you're not American, all these rich people, or whatever. How are you calling yourself American if you make your money in America, but then you say, I don't want to pay these people because of slave retaliation. I'm going to go somewhere else and take my money out of here. But you was American? Yes, or what the so-called definition of American is? I can't understand that. So come together, make it happen, stop the bull. Don't pay no water bills, don't pay no light bills. We got to do it all at the same time. is what we're for. You would just say you're three, four times strike, so am I, you know what I'm saying? Now I'm Islamic. So I haven't really gotten picked on because I've got that power to the people though, so people don't really come up to me then. <laughs> <laughs> they pretty much think I might do something better. <laughs> and I do by any means necessary. I respect everybody who respects me. Yes, power yes. to the people. Uh-huh. Black, white, green, yellow, whoever you are, stand up together and stop allowing other people Tell us who we supposed to be. We are the people. We are the ones who make a difference. We are the real.
drawing attention to the fact that the pollution that we experience everywhere across, and this is a global issue, but just keeping it, just talking about where we are right here in the United States, it disproportionately impacts communities of color and oftentimes, especially black people. We've all heard about lead and flint, what's yeah. going on there. Black communities across this country have been, there have been flints throughout the history of this country and still, and still are very much today. But um, I wanted to talk about Dominion's influence right now in Virginia and in Richmond. Because in addition to them sort of polluting the environment, they have an enormous amount of political power. They are the largest um, non-party contributor to the Virginia Assembly, so they have a huge amount of influence. And if you think about the fact that they are really influencing the process by which laws that are designed to control them and regulate them are being made. So there's a sort of, there's a form of both, they're both a legal monopoly in terms of the energy sector, but also in terms of the way that they have political power and in terms of the capacity for people to hold them accountable. And um, right, right now, like I said today, there was a huge parade today. I know some of the people in the room were, were not parade, there was a huge march today in the occupation of the Capitol building, at least the stairs. And that's where we came from before, um, before we got here. But um, I wanted to... And people just got arrested mm -hmm. because yeah. we were on the Capitol steps mm -hmm. and they forced us to get off the grounds. Thank you. And we weren't doing anything violent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no problem at all. But um, anyways, I wanted to just sort of draw attention to the fact that a lot of what are considered environmental issues, these have a really important role in communities of color, especially African American communities, because throughout history, we've sort of been the targets of a lot of toxic dumping. And um, this is not anything new. This has sort of always been the case. So a lot of times, sort of even in the spirit of remembering black resistance, black power, one of the most egregious insults to the black community has been the polluting of, of black bodies. This happens both in terms of people being in vulnerable neighborhoods, but also if you look at the history of labor, we've heard a lot of really awesome insights about labor. The history of labor, even going back into slavery, the types of abuses, environmental abuses that black bodies have been subjected to, that people who are not from privileged communities have been subjected to. And I think the environmental dimension is one that is increasingly, I think especially with the generation that's coming up, people are really seeing that this is a social justice issue. It's not just about like hiking in the, wo in the woods and enjoying the outdoors. That's really important as well. But in terms of people who are fighting social justice rights, uh, repro reproductive, reproductive rights, people who are trying to get just good food, decent water, <coughs> decent environmental quality, decent playgrounds where their kids aren't gonna be exposed to pollutants. These are also very much tied into struggles for social justice, for racial justice. And um, I think that, you know, even though today I was asked to speak about Dominion, and Dominion is a, is, a, is a huge problem, but I also wanted to think sort of more generally in terms of struggles for social justice, for racial justice, for political economic justice, these things are also have an environmental an environmental dimension to them as well. And like I said, I know everyone has heard about Flint, but um, there are lead problems in a lot of places, and traditionally they have been disproportionately borne by um, communities of color. So that, for, for me, that's something that really animates me. I care a lot about the environment, but my interest in that is from a social justice perspective, because I'm very aware of the fact that the environmental harms that go on all over the world, and in, the, in this country, but also elsewhere, are not, they don't necessarily, they are going to impact everyone, yes, but the people who are bearing the brunt of it are often people of color, and they don't necessarily have the same resources as other people do, especially um, working class people of color, which is the most of, the, most of Richmond is black, is black working class, and they don't always see that in the way that we represent the power structures that are here. But um, so the key, the key idea is for Dominion right now has been permitted to dump toxic waste into, into the James River. Um, this is something that people are really trying to resist. That's one of the reasons why people put themselves in the line today, um, why people were willing to get arrested, things, things like that. And I think that um, it's also important to realize the connections between both the environmental pollution and also the political power structures. Because like I said, Dominion is the largest contributor to um, the, the Virginia General Assembly, and it's not even just a partisan thing. They contribute to both parties. So it's, this type of monopoly makes it very difficult to hold a company 
accountable. And so they get, they really do get away with a lot. And also, I want to say something about the DEQ, which has permitted the dumping. They have a really bad history. The DEQ is very famous for sort of rubber stamping corporate polluting behavior. When I was in Southwest Virginia, I, I worked with working class Appalachian communities, and they were next to um, they were next to a giant military munitions manufacturing plant. And that plant has been sort of rubber stamped to open burn toxic waste right on the banks of the New River. It's called the Radford Army, um, Army the Radford Army Ammunition Plant. But I only mention that because the same people who are allowing Dominion to dump to dump toxic waste into the James River, they have a long history of sort of protecting polluters. And in general, as is the case everywhere, it's usually the people that have the least resources that are going to suffer the most from this. So I just think, I guess, in the spirit of this, this entire meeting, just to always think and remember that environmental issues are a huge part of social justice struggles. And in terms of the historical insults and the contemporary insults that go on today, um, they're, they're also, I mean, I think we hear traditionally about a lot of the social justice stuff, but I just wanted to also draw attention to the fact that in the environment is also something that's very much, that's a huge part of social justice struggles and of, and of various forms of oppression. But um, I'll leave it at that because I know we're really low on time. So if anyone wants to come to me afterwards, I'll be happy to talk more about it. But um, I'll stop.
called ICE. ICE is another word for kill, by the way. So the ICE comes into the community, and and uh, someone can call this hotline, and a bunch of folks can come immediately to the house or the workplace or whatever it is and start videotaping and observing what's going on. And as you know, with Black Lives Matter and cop watch, oftentimes that can be effective. The person might still get arrested, the police won't get beat up. And, and if it's an illegal arrest, people can challenge that. We thought that was a great idea, and we'd like to expand it. You know, there were some white supremacists who got arrested last year in Chesterfield, from Chesterfield County. And they were buying explosives and guns with which they planned to attack Jewish synagogues and black churches in this area. And they got caught. They only got caught because they bought the explosive and guns off an FBI informant. What do we do if we, we get a call from a black church and said they got a call from some white supremacist organization and they're going to come, come over there and burn the place down? Maybe it's just a threat. Maybe it doesn't mean anything. Or, or a mosque or a Jewish synagogue. We shouldn't wait until there's an incident to come over and say, gee, we're really sorry we're standing in your solidarity. We should be there that night. We should go there that night. And what we want to do is sign up some folks who'd like to be on a hot list, where if there is a threat of an incident in the area, if you're free and you can do it, you will be willing to come and stand outside a mosque, a synagogue, a black church, a neighborhood, a Latino community, and in solidarity, and to show the powers that be that these folks are not isolated. Does that do any good? Yeah, it does do some good. If you've ever intervened in a situation where the police were harassing someone, sometimes it can work. Also, this is an election year. And the governor and the mayor are hoping that Hillary Clinton is going to carry Virginia. A raid on the Latino community at this point will not be real helpful if it were known that it happened. A police incident in a democratic city, not helpful an attack on a synagogue, and there's a lot of Jewish voters, a lot of Muslim voters, see? You make, you make this a political issue. And one of the ways you do that is you come physically out. So I'm going to pass this, these sheets of paper around now. And I ask, would you consider, maybe you can just pick one and pass the other one. If you're interested, no pressure, but if you're interested, and then if folks sign up, we'll call a little meeting and have a discussion. Nothing that's going to make people feel uncomfortable, but we don't want to wait until there's a problem. Particularly with Trump going back and forth through Virginia over the rest of this year, whipping people up. They're organized. We want to be organized. That's all. <coughs> Second thing, um, this meeting here, I think it was terrific. I hope you did too. Defenders works with organizations from across the state to pull together something called the Virginia People's Assembly for Jobs, Peace, and Justice. And it's like this meeting multiplied five or ten times. People from all different communities and all different struggles get together and explain where they're coming from, and build solidarity, and work out concrete things they can do to support each other. The next one will be on Saturday, April 23rd. It was the Memorial. Uh, Methodist, uh, Wesley, Uni Wesley United, Mem sorry, it's five names. Wesley <laughs> Memorial United Methodist Church on the Kansasville Turnpike. If you signed up, you'll get a notice about it in about a week. And we invite you to come to that. Very similar, but bigger and, and more dynamic and bigger. Um, third thing is, we're an all volunteer organization. There's no salaries. We did have to get a little office this year, first time in 12 years, because Anna and I had a move and we didn't have any more room for a Home office. So we're paying $250 a month for a very nice little, little uh, <coughs> office with all utilities. Can't beat that. But it's $250 a month. It costs a thousand bucks to put out the paper, and you ate forty dollars worth of food today. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna pass this button. This, you know, all these things are free. No one has ever turned away for any reason. But if you got you know, can kick something in, we very much appreciate it. We gotta pay the rent. Actually, a few days overdue. Okay. Um, and that's that. And then the other thing is, uh, we don't have to actually be out of the whole building to five. If you'd like to come out, scoff up with us some food, talk among yourselves, and so on. We ran a little late, and I'm sorry, so we didn't have a time for a lot of talk. Is Anna here? No, we've got no idea. 
We still love you. We still love you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't want to, you know. I think one comment, one way to point back. I voted, making sure you registered to vote and support progressive candidates like Bernie Sanders. That's one way to get people in power that are going to change the system by electing progressive over Democrats. Oh, we haven't actually been kicked out, so yeah. if folks want to make a comment, now would be the time to do it. But we will kind of be hanging out in the lobby here for a little bit, too. We're really sorry there wasn't more time for the discussion, but some of you came late and we wanted to wait. We didn't want you to miss Malcolm's speech. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Really. Thank you.